Good morning. I'd like to welcome you once again to Calling on the Name of the Lord podcast for today, the 24th day of February in the year of our Lord, 2021. My name is Russ McCullough and I'm coming to you live from historic Mint Hill, North Carolina. On behalf of the Archdale Church of Christ in Charlotte, North Carolina, located at 2525 Archdale Drive. And we worship live and in person on the Lord's Day at 10 a.m. and again at 6 p.m. And if you are able, we invite you to join us as we gather around the Lord's table and worship God in spirit and in truth. We are engaged in a st series of studies of salvational passages in the New Testament, and no book in the New Testament has more to do with salvation than the book of Acts. So we're going through the book of Acts verse by verse and seeing what the scripture has to say. We believe that the scripture is self-interpreting. It means what it says and says what it means. It's written very plainly if we only have ears to hear as Christ enjoins us to have. And so we are in the book of Acts chapter 19 and yesterday we observed a passage of verses 28 through 34 and we constructed together uh, questions from that passage. Uh, good morning, Brother Mary. Glad you're here. We take the scripture, open it up, ask questions from the scripture, and then we answer the scripture questions with the scripture. It's all about revelation and not about speculation. It's not about my opinion or your opinion. It is what God says, and that is what we do. And right now, we'll go ahead and read the passage from yesterday. We will answer the questions we posed together on yesterday. Then we will look at a new section of scripture today. Afterwards, in that passage, uh, will be verses 28 through, um, excuse me, uh, verses 35 through the end of the chapter. That's what we'll be looking at today. We'll read that passage after we answer the questions. We'll make observations about that passage. Then together we'll construct new questions from the passage. And then, Lord willing, we will answer those questions tomorrow morning. And so, uh, please join with me in the reading of the scripture from yesterday. Now, after these events, excuse me, when they heard this, they were enraged and were, that's, uh, were crying out, Great is Artemis of the Ephesians. So the city was filled with confusion, and they rushed together into the theater, dragging with them Gaius and Aristarchus, Macedonians who were Paul's companions in travel. But when Paul wished to go in among the crowd, the disciples would not let him. And even some of the Asiarchs, who were friends of his, sent to him and were urging him not to venture into the theater. Now some cried out one thing and some another, for the assembly was in confusion, and most of them did not know why they had come together. Some of the crowd prompted Alexander, whom the Jews had put forward, and Alexander, motioning with his hand, wanted to make a defense to the crowd. But when they recognized that he was a Jew, 
For about two hours they all cried out with one voice, Great is Artemis of the Ephesians. Okay, so that's the passage. Uh, now we'll uh, answer the questions we posed yesterday from the Scripture, and the answers will come from the Scripture, because we understand that what Christ said in the last chapter of Revelation is extremely, extremely serious, and that is to neither add to nor take away from the Word of God. That is what we're all about here on Calling on the Name of the Lord podcast. And we enjoin all persons, uh, beginning with myself, to be noble regarding these matters, as were the Bereans in Acts chapter 17, verse 11, who were more noble than the Thessalonians because they eagerly embraced the gospel and searched the scriptures daily to see whether or not these things were true. And so that is my challenge and yours, to search the scriptures daily to see whether or not these things are indeed true. Okay, question number one. What does the word, quote, they, refer to in verse 28? They refers to, this is our reading comprehension exercise we want to understand when we see pronouns who they refer to so the word they in verse 28 refers to the crowd or the mob assembled by Demetrius the silversmith regarding uh, Artemis of the Ephesians the false god that they worshiped in Ephesus that's who the word they refers to question number two to what does the word quote, this, refer to in verse 28. This refers to what Paul had been preaching, that uh, the gods, little g, that they worshipped, especially Artemis of the Ephesians, were no gods at all. They didn't exist. They were imaginary. And this enraged these people. And that's what the word this refers to in verse 28. Uh, to the message of Paul that God's little g are no God at all. Good morning, Henry. I'm glad you're here. and glad you shared the, the podcast. Uh, we appreciate that. And we fulfill the Great Commission whenever we share the gospel with others. Okay. Uh, question number three, what emotion does the crowd now exhibit? Uh, the Bible says they were enraged, out of their mind with anger. Question number four, what does the crowd or the mob now cry out? Uh, mobs have mantras, slogans, and this particular mob uh, cried out constantly, great is Artemis of the Ephesians, or as other translations say, Diana of the Ephesians. Okay, question number seven. Who did the crowd drag into the theater with them? Uh, mobs need someone to blame their troubles on. And this particular mob kidnapped two men. Uh, their names were uh, Gaius and also uh, Aristarchus. Now, Gaius and Aristarchus were Macedonians, Greeks, uh, that were Paul's traveling companions. These were fellow Christians that were traveling with Paul. And they kidnapped these two and drug them into the theater, which we spoke of yesterday in Ephesus as an outdoor theater and very, very large. It could accommodate nearly the entire population of the city. So they drug uh, them down to the theater. Now the theater, as we observed yesterday, is not constructed like theaters are today where the stage is higher than the audience. 
in the ancient world in Ephesus uh, specifically here the stage was at the bottom of a hill and all the seating was carved into the side of the hill and went up so all the audience looked down on the stage and said the other way around and so uh, this mob drug uh, Gaius and Articus uh, onto this stage at the bottom of the hill okay uh, question number eight we've answered that already they're traveling companions of Paul fellow Christians uh, question number nine who wanted to go into the theater to make a defense uh, that was Paul he was right adamant about it but um, we'll go to question number nine here or uh, question number ten rather uh, who would not let him go? And it was the disciples. Well, who were the disciples? It's the Church of Christ at Ephesus. They just flat out refused to let him. They physically restrained Paul from going into the theater to defend his fellow travelers and fellow Christians. Uh, question number 11. Who sent word urging Paul not to go in? Another group of people... Uh, wanted him not to go in. Friends of his, ruling persons from the ruling council of Asia. The Bible refers to them as the Asiarchs. Asiarch, ruling people of the council of Asia. Asiarchs. Uh, question number 13. How, according to verse 32, is confusion illustrated yesterday of course we noted that confusion is the goal of Satan always Satan is chaos Satan is confusion and he sows it among men to distract their hearts from the gospel God on the other hand is a God of peace not of chaos not of confusion okay uh, this confusion is illustrated by the mob. Some said one thing and some said another. They contradicted one another, but they were united in their anger and hatred for Paul. But they were confused and contradicted one another right there and didn't even realize it. That's what mobs do. They Mobs are made up of people who wouldn't agree on the color of the sky, except they're united in some kind of irrational rage against a person or thing. And we see that in this day and time. Mobs form in places like Portland and Seattle and do terrible things. But uh, if you would dissect the mob, you'd find that People have nothing in common whatsoever except their common uh, rage against something or another. Okay. Uh, question number 14. This again illustrates the confusion of the hour. Most of the crowd was ignorant of what? They were ignorant as to why they were even there. It was a mob. Mobs don't think. Uh, they just act like animals. And that's the closest that a human becomes an animal is in a mob in the midst of anarchy. Some prompted, uh, the next question, number 15, some prompted who to speak? The Jews prompted a man by the name of Alexander to speak. Uh, and uh, who had put him forward as a speaker? Question number 16. That's, of course, the Jews uh, who are in the middle of this mob, Jews and Gentiles alike. We talked about that yesterday, how uh, mortal enemies sometimes band together in violence, as did the Germans and the Russians 
in the rape of Poland in 1939. People only remember Hitler's invasion of Poland, but they'd made a pact with the Russians, and the Russians invaded Poland from the other side, and they divided that poor country up and murdered its citizens together until the end of the war. The history of Poland here is a terrible one, but it illustrates how sometimes mortal enemies in a mob action will work together. Question number 17. What happened when the crowd recognized Alexander as a Jew? Well, uh, uh, they shouted him down. Now, why would they shout Alexander down as a Jew? Because they were there in agreement against Paul. Well, the Jews believed in only one God uh, incorrectly at this point. They believed in the God of the Old Testament, which is the true God, but they rejected the New Testament of God in Jesus Christ. And so they were, uh, the Jews were monolithic uh, in their view of God. Uh, and these Gentiles were polytheistic. They believed in many gods, little g. And uh, the Jews believed in only one God, the true God, but they rejected God's message. So they saw the Jews as adversarial. Uh, question number 18. How long did the crowd continuously shout their slogan? This mob shouted this slogan, Great is Artemis of the Ephesians, for two whole hours. And so that brings us to today's portion of Scripture, Acts chapter 19, verses 35 to 41, which we'll now read. We'll make observations about it, and then we will construct our questions together and... Uh, so we'll uh, urge you to take your pen and paper out. Be prepared to do that here in just a moment. But first of all, we want to read and observe. Question number, I mean, uh, verse number 35, Acts chapter 19. And when the town clerk had quieted the crowd, he said, Men of Ephesus, who is there who does not know that the city of the Ephesians is temple keeper of the great Artemis, and of the sacred stone that fell from the sky? Seeing then that these things cannot be denied, you ought to be quiet and do nothing rash. For you have brought these men here who are neither sacrilegious nor blasphemers of our goddess. If therefore Demetrius and, his, and the craftsmen with him have a complaint against anyone, the courts are open and there are proconsuls. Let them bring charges against one another. But if you seek anything further, it shall be settled in the regular assembly. For really, we are in danger of being charged with rioting today, since there is no cause that we can give to justify this commotion. And when he had said these things, he dismissed the assembly. Well, it's amazing how things turn out. And, well, not really, because God is in control of all things. Mm -hmm. God is protecting the lives of these two, uh, Gaius and also Aristarchus, Christians. And there's a mob of maybe ten to 15,000 people enraged, stirred up to mob action by Demetrius the silversmith. And yet, a non-Christian, 
a person we don't even know his name, who happened to be the town clerk. Uh, he came in and quieted the crowd. And then he just began to tell them facts. Uh, it's interesting, because usually mobs don't care for facts at all. But uh, this man apparently was a very persuasive person and well uh, thought of by the citizens of Ephesus. And so they listened to him. So he addresses them not as a mob. He calls them men of Ephesus. And then he uh, begins to brag about the city of Ephesus and how great it is. This is, uh, uh, is there anyone here that doesn't know that Ephesus, the city of the Ephesians, uh, is temple keeper, temple keeper of the great Artemis and of the sacred stone that fell from the sky? And he says, seeing that these things can't be that, you can't deny how great we are. Look, we're the keepers of all these things. We're wonderful. Uh, and then he begins to make his case. After he's buttered them up, he's called them men. These are mobsters. They're not men. They're not acting like men, but he refers to them as men. Coddles them, as it were. And uh, he says, hey, we're part of the great city of Ephesians. We take care of the great Artemis. Okay. <clears throat> then he begins to say, look, these can't be. These things cannot be denied, and uh, therefore, you should not do anything rash, uh, because you've uh, brought these men here, and they've not done anything. Gaius and Aristarchus, Christian men. They're not guilty here, as he says, of being sacrilegious towards Artemis, uh, nor uh, have they blasphemed our goddess. And then he gets right down to the nitty-gritty. He says, look, if Demetrius and his craftsman buddies want to make a case here, guess what? The courts are open. The lawyers are ready. If you got a case, make a case, make a charge, take it to court. And uh, if you want to go beyond that, he said, you'll have to take it up at the General Assembly of the city. We're not going to make laws in the middle of a mob action. He says, I, I want to warn you that, uh, guess what, you're in the middle of a great threat to yourselves. Uh, this is a sort of an, a veiled threat from the town clerk. He, he says, you're, you're right on the edge of creating a riot. And if the government declares you to be rioters, you're going to be the one in court, and not Gaius and Aristarchus, because you have no case, you have no charge, you can't bring anything of substance against these two men that you've kidnapped and brought here to this mob action. And then it says, of course, when he had said these things, he dismissed the assembly. So God has providentially intervened using the town clerk to save the lives of Gaius and Aristarchus. And 
God saves our lives each and every day. We may or may not know it, but God is our protector and our preserver who providentially provides for it. Jesus Christ sustains all things at all times by the power of his word. Amen. <coughs> okay, so that was the the passage. Now we're going to create um, questions for it before we do. Uh, thank you for being here. Uh, thank you for putting your names in the comment section. Uh, if you have questions or comments, please put them in the comment section as well. And as uh, Brother Henry did, uh, share this podcast on your timeline and on other social media in which you may be engaged because by so doing, you and I work together with God uh, to fulfill the Great Commission to take the gospel daily to the whole world. And that's what Facebook and other social media do. Uh, we're not just speaking to each other. We're speaking to the whole world. Uh, and an audience on Facebook may not arrive until some time later. Uh, once things go on the Internet, they're there to stay. And uh, it's quite possible God can use this podcast to convert a soul to Christ long after all of us are gone and someone happens to to find these messages on the internet in some archive or another in future years. And the message we proclaim here, as we do every day, is that we answer the question, what must I do to be saved? The question of your life, the question of my life, what must I do to be saved? And the book of Acts articulates that answer in a number of places, but most prominently, the first gospel sermon, when this question was uh, asked by the panicked persons who had been pricked in their hearts of murdering Jesus Christ, Peter replied, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins or the forgiveness of sins and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit and Acts chapter 2 verse 47 says on that day that those who obeyed the gospel were added to the church of Christ the body of Christ the bride of Christ by the Lord himself and so that's the gospel message we proclaim every day here on calling on the name of the Lord podcast by the way, calling on the name of the Lord is synonymous with baptism. Calling on the name of the Lord for salvation is baptism, immersion in water, in the name, under the authority of Jesus Christ, specifically and singularly for the remission or the forgiveness of sins in order to receive the gift of the Holy Spirit and to be added to the church by the Lord himself. This is found in Acts chapter 22, 16, when Ananias, speaking to Saul, who still had his sins, after his sight had been restored, he says, Why do you wait? Why do you tarry? Arise, get up, and be baptized, washing away your sins, sins that he still had, even after three days of praying and fasting, still had his sins, washing away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. Calling on the name of the Lord is water baptism, and water baptism is calling on the name of the Lord because it's in the waters of baptism that is the only place, according to Paul in Colossians 2, 11 and 12, where the circumcision of Christ is used by God in a powerful work to remove our sins from us. This takes place only and exclusively and singularly in the waters of baptism 
and nowhere else. And so, my friend, you've now heard the gospel message and the answer to the question, what must I do to be saved? You now know what that answer is. Okay, so we are now going to construct the questions for this passage that we just <clears throat> read. Question number one. Who quieted the crowd? Again, uh, take your pen and paper, write these questions down. Uh, but in case you cannot for some reason, uh, we will post these questions in the comments section uh, afterwards that will be posted on Facebook. And also, we'll archive this on our YouTube channel, Archdale Church of Christ, where we have nearly 200 sermons, lessons, and studies for your edification. Uh, we encourage you to visit that site, subscribe, and uh, we add uh, about nine messages a week onto this site, which we then reload onto uh, Facebook on my Facebook page, Russell H. McCullough, no period after H, Russell H. McCullough, uh, right here, and you can see all of these messages. Also, we have a hashtag here on Facebook, hashtag capital A, capital X, 2384, capital U. Hashtag AX 2384U. Acts 238 is for you. And so if you go to Facebook and type in in the search bar uh, this hashtag, uh, these lessons will come up about salvation. Okay, uh, question number two. Uh, how does he address the crowd? What does he say about the city of the Ephesians. Question number four. What does he say that cannot be denied? Question number five. He in joins the crowd to not do what two things. He joins the crowd to not do what two things. Question number six. What two things are the two men 
not guilty of. Question number seven. Per verse uh, 30. No. Ver verse 29. Per verse 29, what are the names of the two accused men? Question number eight. What recourse does Demetrius and his craftsmen have? regarding their accusations. Question number nine. What second recourse do they also have. Question number 10. What real danger does he warned the crowd about. Question number 11. Why is this warning true? Question number 12. What was the result? of the town clerk's speech. What were was the result of the town clerk's speech? So those are 12 questions we've uh, put together. Together, uh, we'll post these again on the comment section here in just a moment uh, once we go off air and uh, have them there for you if you were unable to write them down as we went. Again, thank you for being here. Thank you for liking us on Facebook. Thank you for sharing the gospel message by sharing this podcast on your timeline and other social media. Thank you for telling others about what we do here. We appreciate you so much for being here. Uh, and uh, may God bless you all today and Lord willing we'll see you tomorrow at the same time 10 o'clock on Calling on the Name of the Lord podcast tonight at 7 the Archdale Church of Christ midweek Bible study hour will be right here at 7 p.m. we are looking at 
the introduction to the book of Revelation. Specifically, we're going to look at the seven churches of Asia. And one of those seven churches happens to be the Church of Christ at Ephesus, the place we were talking of today. And so thank you and God bless you.